So good Sunday morning, everybody. What a week. Ups and downs and all arounds. I don't, I don't think it matters where you are on any of the issues. What a week, Up and, ups and downs and all arounds. Um, I want to welcome, uh, Philip, thanks for dialing in from the car on your birthday weekend. And I want to welcome Clancy and I, I saw Roma there in the back waving. So always, always good to see you. And Tracy, thank you for balancing out the Charles. I know you have other things that you um, do on Sundays as well. It's always a pleasure to have you here. And everybody, of course, that make up Prajna Heart Zen Center. Thank you for being here. I wanted to talk today about um, inspiration. If, if you saw the newsletter, you probably have a hint at that. And, um, you know, in the context of our practice, but even more largely in the, in the context of our lives and I try to weave some, some things together here. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, optimize for sound. Where's that? Guys seeing the screen? Yep. Um, this, this is a, a picture of a road in uh, New Mexico, Indian Service Route 9, IS-9. And uh, as, as I wrote uh, a little bit in the newsletter, and if you didn't read it, I'll just paraphrase here. Open stretches of road like this always open me up in a way. Um, you know, that infinite possibility does. And here you've got this boom. And this is two lanes of highway like this. The shoulder here is actually wider than it is in many places. That runs diagonally from Cuba, New Mexico to Gallup, New Mexico through the Navajo Nation. And it often looks like this. And those of you that know, the Navajo Nation is 27,413 square miles of, of land. It covers parts of Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. Um, that's 17,544,500 acres. That's larger than 10 states in the United States, 10 individual states. And it encompasses an area that is equivalent to combined New Hampshire, New Jersey, Connecticut, Delaware, and Rhode Island. Huge, huge. And in all of that land, according to the 2010 census, there are 173,667 people. So vast land and not a lot of people. So when you're driving this road, and this is just partly through the Navajo Nation, but the experience of it is a lot of emptiness, a lot of emptiness. And you'll see, you know, Hogan's off on the right, and then you'll come up over the rim of a mesa and, and, and down another level. And frighteningly, there are loose horses everywhere, and they might be crossing the road or gra grazing right on the side of the road. And they're a little scrawnier at times of year when the grass looks like this than you would like them to be. There are um, the different communities, Torreon, Pueblo Pintado, and the council houses, and, and occasionally an, uh, a revival evangelical Christian tent set up, you know, with the Jesus saves. And um, it's, it's 
it's quite the experience. And at different times, you'll be going through this land and thunderstorms will be coming through. Um, walking rain, as we call it in the Southwest, where you've got a horizon like this. And the rain, you can see columns of rain coming down and moving across the horizon with a black cloud, but it's like a distinct column. And I remember so clearly the one time that I drove right into one of those and the thunder and lightning were going. But anyway, it's, it's massive, the, the land, the space, the sky, the, the lack of water. And I always imagine what it would be like to live you know, in that much emptiness. Now, of course, as Ken knows from visiting, we did live in a fair amount of emptiness in, in um, New Mexico when we had our little farm there, as we had our 20 acres, but um, from the river across was the Santa Fe National Forest and from the highway across the other way was the Carson Nat National Forest. And the nearest neighbor was their home was about half a mile away. And um, our mailbox was a third of a mile up the gravel driveway. So you, you get the idea, a lot of space. So in this week, I was reminded of the Navajo Nation and all that space and what it means by a story I ran into of this young woman. Her name is Allie Young. She's 30 years old. I don't know if any of you saw this story. Um, she is a member of the Navajo Nations, Nation, and she had great concern about the historical and present disenfranchisement of her people. And namely, in all of the Navajo Nation, there are just a handful of places where you can vote. And uh, a lot of people have transportation issues. They live miles from, you know, neighbors and even further from polling places. So she created a, a movement in an organization called Ride to the Polls. And she thought that it would be quite something to combine the history and heritage of, of horseback, travel by horseback in, in the Navajo Nation or the Diné Nation with getting people to the polls. And, and she started this as a way to get young people re-engaged in the culture and getting them to the polls so that they could vote in this election. And you know, here's a picture of her leading generally groups of like 10 to 15 people at a time on horseback to the polls. Now, those of you that know me um, know that I, I can tear up rather easily um, at things. And I always know I'm inspired when one or two things happens. It's just like an overwhelming sense of joy that almost bursts out like dancing and laughter. And, and, the, and the other thing is just uncontrollable tears streaming down my face and trouble telling a story. Here's a 30 year old woman living in the Navajo Nation who decided to do something about getting her people so that their voices could be heard in this election. And, and, and here they are. Now, Groups of 10 to 15 people, I, that doesn't sound like much. It, you know, it's not much in, in a, a, you know, in absolute numerical terms, it's 10 to 15 people. But when they showed up at the polling site, there were lots of other people that had shown up to vote, inspired by the fact that there was this ride to the polls. So they had found their own way to the polls. And then news of this got out on the internet, you know, Facebook, et cetera, to other Native American nations across the country. And they saw a huge uptick in engagement and interest and participation in the election. 
So never, never ever doubt your own ability as one person, 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years old or 70 or 80 <laughs> or 94 like Thich Nhat Hanh or dead, you know, like Martin Luther King. Right about it. <laughs> to inspire others and create a movement and create change in the world. Her father, this is Frank Young, is 58 years old. And, and he says, you know, I, I was, I, I had reached a point of cynicism about our ability to affect change in our nation. And, and here he is riding side by side with his daughter. I mean, I, I saw this picture, I was just like, I just, you know, wept. I was like, this is so beautiful. And you look at the expressions on their faces and what they're doing. I've got Lori crying. So anyway, um, <laughs> really, really beautiful story. And I found myself so inspired, you know, by this young 30 year old woman. You know, what is inspiration and, and what inspires you? This is um, Molly Milligan, who's a friend of ours. And she and our other friend, Barbara Matthews, that's Barbara in the middle there. And some of you will recognize this is because when we took the Sangha to the downtown women's center in um, downtown LA and cooked, there's Ken looking great in a hairnet, Ken. We all look, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you got Barbara and Molly who, um, you know, at risk to their personal health a few weeks ago, took off to Nevada to um, work on get out the vote efforts in Nevada. And um, they, they did group activities and they, and they knocked on doors and, and they decided, described that, uh, you know, when you're knocking on doors, there's no guarantee that the person answering it on the other side, one is not going to be hostile and two, wearing a, there's no guarantee they're gonna be wearing a mask or not. And once the polling places were open, they were working as observers. And they were working as observers as, as well. Um, both of them are attorneys. They drove to Nevada to, like Ali Young, make sure that people had the opportunity and the chance to vote. Um, we were on a Zoom call with them last Sunday. And it was kind of funny because Barbara was upstairs in her home and her husband, uh, Rob, was downstairs because they went into self-quarantine while their test results came back. And, and Rob is working on movie sets. Uh, he's actually a cinematographer and occasional director for the show Blackish. So he's got to be on the set all the time. So they had to stay uh, apart from each other so that he could continue working. So anyway, Molly and, and Barr. And, and you know, we're doing everything we can do here, but here's just two of our friends that picked up and went. <laughs> You know, I, I find that inspiring as well. And I, you know, consistently, I mean, there's nature and there's big open space, but doesn't a lot of inspiration come from those around us, from what we see other people doing, how they're manifesting the impossible possible. Another gentleman and a book, uh, the book is by Tracy Kidder, great writer. The, the, the gentleman in question here is Dr. Paul Farmer. As it says here, a man who would cure the world. He founded Partners in Health, an uh, organization um, working, gosh, I think they started in Haiti and then ended up in prisons in Russia and then in Rwanda. And Tracy Kidder and, and, and beyond, and I'll connect some things here in a minute, uh, Tracy Kidder wrote this great book. If you have not read this book, I, I recommend reading it. I was thinking maybe we should read it at, as part of our book club. Um, this book did more to inspire me in my Zen practice and walking this path and owning this path and wearing the robes than, than almost any other book because this is a book, again, of an individual who decided that the approach to AIDS in the world and 
um, recurrent tuberculosis was being completely mismanaged by the World Health Organization, by the government, by this belief that the problem was bigger than could be solved, that there was not enough money to solve it. And while he was um, a student at Brigham Young, and then I think later, uh, I think Boston. I, yeah, Brigham Young, and then I think MIT later, I might have that wrong. But he, he was working on his doctoral thesis and, and created a situation so that he could be gone, essentially being on the ground, working with people. And this led me to look a little bit deeper. What drives one person to take this on and to completely change the equation for healthcare of two of the bigger health crises in, in, in our lifetimes? We're, we're in the middle of another one, obviously. And it turns out that Dr. Paul Farmer was a, an adherent to an, a, a, a uh, student of what's called um, liberation theology. And liberation theology comes out of the Catholic Church. Like I said, we're going to weave lots of threads here together. <laughs> comes out of the Catholic Church. And um, liberation theology says that the entire point of Christianity, Catholicism, of spiritualism, of this practice is to liberate others. And core to liberation theology is what is called the preferential option for the poor, which means you over index for those that do not have. You do not spend your life serving those that have, but you put everything into and over, turn the dial all the way toward those who are underserved. And that's what you commit your life to. Current Pope Francis, who, who took his name from St. Francis of Assisi, the current Pope Francis comes out of the liberation theology movement. It's considered a radical movement out of South America in the Catholic Church and some of the more traditional uh, archbishops and popes were you know, tried to put it down at one point. But anyway, so this book, Mountains Beyond Mountains, and I'm not saying everybody should do this, but led me to read oh, two or three or four books on liberation theology and Dr. Paul Farmer, which led me also to, um, now this is in context of my Zen practice, because my Zen practice opened me to a lot of this, and this opened me to what is possible as one person. And, and I'll kind of shorthand this, but I mean, it also led to me ending up in Rwanda um, and meeting with President Paul Kagame and then going out on a tour of the countryside to partners in health hospitals and healthcare centers um, where they were attacking the AIDS crisis in Rwanda. And I also there found myself in tears as I met and worked with some of the people that had dedicated their lives and left their comfort to put this preferential option for the poor into action. Along with me on that trip was a client of mine from Cisco Systems, Piper Gianola, because Lori and I, and Piper had founded an organization called Goal4.org, which was to eradicate infant mortality in the world along the lines of the Millennium Development Goals, the first set of Millennium De Development Goals. The fourth goal was to eliminate or, or reduce, reduce infant mortality, you know, by a significant more, uh, proportion. Goal4.org still exists today. Lori and I are not active in it, but Piper took it and ran with it. She took what we started there and she took all her resources as a member of the Cisco community and the tech community in Silicon Valley and is to this day working in Kenya 
um, as the executive director and co-founder and, and a leader of goal4.org. So you never know. You never know. Read a book, do Zazen, find yourself in a meeting with the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, launch, launch a nonprofit that's going despite your non-involvement. You know, books. What books inspire you? You know, let's 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 share these things and, and get the cross inspiration going. Partners in health, interestingly enough, in the last five or six years, started up an operation in the Navajo Nation, in, in the uh, Torium community of the Navajo Nation. And so I am um, connected by, by a friend of ours, George Hatch. He said, you know, um, Paul and his team have started up in uh, the Navajo Nation in New Mexico. And this is when we were living in Mexi New Mexico. And he connected me to a doctor and another source of inspiration, Sonia Chin, Sonia Shin, who lives in Gallup, New Mexico. And um, I, I went down to the Torian Council House to meet with her and, and to see, you know, what, if anything, I could do to help with, with those efforts. Um, I couldn't, the, the land is so vast and uncharted that I couldn't find the council house. You know, and, and I and we're like driving around in circles in the Navajo Nation and some of those roads are pretty rough. And finally, I, I spotted my savior. And if you've ever lived in the country, um, Galen, you probably know this. There is one person who always knows how to get everywhere, maybe two. In this case, it was the brown UPS truck driver. I spotted a UPS truck and I chased it down and, and, and like, you know, flagged down the UPS truck and said, I'm trying to find the Torreon Council House. Where is it? And he, he pointed me the way and I met with Sonia Shin. And as I was meeting with Sonia Shin, I'll be damned if I didn't look off into the distance across the Navajo Nation and there was Cabazon Peak, which was the site of, um, my first 50 mile run that I hadn't yet done, but, but yeah. did. Ken's nodding his head. <laughs> Ken's nodding his head, Ken was there. Um, there was Cabazon in the distance. Another source of inspiration, put your feet on the land. Find what you are capable of. Where do you stretch? Where do you stretch? For me, it was like, how far can I go on my feet? Can I cover 50 miles? Can I break my leg in the process? <laughs> and still cross the finish line. There is Cabazon beckoning in the distance. And the, the morning of that run, about six miles in, you, you start low and you go up on a mesa. And about six miles in, the sun came up, wearing a headlamp at this point. But about six miles in, the sun starts coming up. Here comes another moment of tears. The sun's coming up. I'm running on Navajo land, on the Continental Divide Trail through Navajo land, and the coyotes start howling. <laughs> I'm telling you, that kind of thing can and does bring me to my knees. You know, I'm, here I am embarking on this journey across Navajo land. The sun is coming up and the coyotes are howling. Where do you find inspiration? You know, I talked about people. I don't know if any of you saw this or if you know the comedian uh, David Chappelle. Um, he did a bit on Saturday Night Live, Saturday, after news um, from the election came in. And I am going to see if we can Oh, come on. Okay, hang on. We'll make this work one way or the other. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to skip ahead. It's a great bit altogether if you want to uh, 
watch it. Watch this. That was cold, man. Meanwhile, Chris Christie's fat ass was in the ICU fighting for his Oops. Okay. Wasn't supposed to be the Chris Christie part, but let's go ahead again anyway. Ladies and gentlemen. But if you're a good white, you actually want to help, and join me. I'm not even joking. This is my, this is my plan. It's called the Kindness Conspiracy. It's random acts of kindness for black people. Do something nice for a black person just because they're black. And you got to make sure they don't deserve it. That's a very important part of it. They can't deserve it. The same way all them years they did terrible things to black people just because they're black and they didn't deserve it. If you're driving through the hood one day and you see a black dude standing on the corner selling crack, destroying his community, buy him an ice cream. Just buy him some ice cream. <laughs> He'll be suspicious, but he'll take it. I would implore everybody who's celebrating the day to remember it's good to be a humble winner. Remember when I was here four years ago? Remember how bad that felt? Remember that half the country right now still feels that way. Please remember that. Remember that for the first time in the history of America, the life expectancy of white people is dropping because of heroin, because of suicide, all these white people out there that feel that anguish, that pain, that mad because they think nobody cares, and maybe they don't. Let me tell you something. I know how that feels. I promise you, I know how that feels. If you're a police officer, and every time you put your uniform on, you feel like you got a target on your back. You're appalled by the ingratitude that people have when you would risk your life to save them. Oh, man, believe me. Believe me. I know how that feels. Everyone knows how that feels. But here's the difference between me and you. You guys hate each other for that. And I don't hate anybody. I just hate that feeling. That's what I fight through. That's what I suggest you fight through. You got to find a way to live your life. You got to find a way to forgive each other. You gotta find a way to find joy in your existence in spite of that feeling. And if you can't do that, come get these nigga lessons. Thank you very much and good night. Uh yeah, I, I found myself getting emotional even at watching that. Okay, so there's a, there's a really important point in there. And again, I'm not going to make assumptions about anybody on the Zoom call. Regardless of where you fall of what's been going on in the last week, it's about half and half. You know, there's 70 million people that voted for Trump and 74 and change that voted for Biden. You know, that, that leaves a whole lot of people feeling like they lost something. And that's, you know, that's, that's not to be gloated over or glossed over or forgotten because if we're gonna get this right, we have to find a way to work together. Uh, David Chappelle, I mean, it's a hilarious skit, uh, you know, uh, politically inappropriate or incorrect as his always go. Uh, it's worth watching the whole thing. But when you shift there to the end, that one line, I don't hate anybody. I don't hate anybody. Hate is something that has to be conjured. 
that is not a naturally arising emotion. You know, I don't hate anybody is a choice we can make. Um, I'm not gonna play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. That would take us another hour and five minutes to do. <laughs> music, right? Whether it's classical music or get you up on your feet dancing music, right? I remember being in college listening to this Ninth Symphony in D minor with the string section coming in all by myself. And, and, and feeling my heart just break open. Some of you may know this piece of music or not. You know, music, art. Often, you know, I mean, inspiration can be found in the Dodger Stadium among a lot of people. It can be found, you know, with Lori and in, in doing something. I found that sometimes some of the most profound moments of epiphany of, or aha, I got it, or, or when I'm by myself and things are quiet. A little bit like sitting zazen. You know, pre-pandemic, as, as many of you know, I've, I travel a fair amount. I found myself in Amsterdam running a workshop and uh, in between activities of the workshop, I was alone in Amsterdam and I was like, well, what am I gonna do? Probably not the right time to get high, you know? I don't really need to go see the red light district again. Um, you know, when, when I already got my run in, um, what am I gonna do? And I did something that, you know, Lori will laugh because when we're together, it's like, you know, let's go look at art. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? You know, it's like, I'm not always, always there for going and, and seeing art, but this time I was like, I had on one of my runs run by the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam and I was like, oh, maybe I'll stop in there. And I went and spent a couple hours in the Van Gogh Museum bawling. Because, you know, I mean, I, I know Van Gogh, I've, and I know he cut off his ear and, you know, and, and you, know, uh, you didn't know Van Gogh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> At that level, like I knew about Van Gogh and, and Starry Night and, you know, all that stuff. I actually got to know Van Gogh, you know, I, I took myself on a self-guided several hour tour through that museum, through a tour of his life and the pain and suffering that created that outpouring through the brush on the canvas. And, and I was slayed, I was slayed. And I came home not fully able to express that to Lori. The difference is she got it, so I didn't have to. And I handed her a coffee mug with, you know, the, yeah, this is, this is Lori's souvenir from Amsterdam. <laughs> but we looked at each other and, and knew that we had a connection there through that. You know, so, you know, back to the open road and, the Diné Nation and what this represents for me. You know, it's a lot like the Enso. It's a lot like sitting Zazen. It's about creating that space. You know, where, where does the inspiration come from? You know, it comes from that center, from that core, from that emptiness, from that place of calm, that place that we can clear out so that the Van Goghs and the Lorries and the Phillips and the Arts and Marshes and Tracy's and Charles and Galen's can create something new out of it. So that somebody like Allie Phillips in the Navajo Nation can see a different way to get people to the polls. I think I'll end here. Shema do That means my mother and my father brought me up and my siblings up in our Dene way of life. And I am completely blessed for that. 
The trail ride was actually my dad's idea. My dad is a little bit old school and was becoming really frustrated and wasn't feeling particularly motivated to vote in this election. He had this vision of all of us riding because my dad is deeply connected to his horses. When I'm united with my horse, you know, it's, it's so awesome. It's just, you know, um, everything is beautiful. We pulled this trail ride together today called Ride to the Poles because our indigenous children, our native children across the country are feeling the urge to reconnect to our culture more than ever. And we thought this was a great way for them to feel inspired and motivated to vote in honor of our ancestors who rode longer miles to make their voices heard uh, in voting at the polls. When one mounts a horse and is in rhythm with the horse, we feel connected and we call that horse medicine. I wanted our people, our Dinette people here in Arizona, to ride with that spirit and let it enter them and take that to the polls because this election is one of the most important in our lives. When I vote for indigenous peoples, I vote for protecting our land. I vote for protecting our elders, especially those who have been severely impacted by COVID-19. Our languages, our cultures, and our spirituality. We're so divided across this country. As Diné people, we talk about restoring balance, what we call Hojon, the beauty way. I can see my ancestors when I look at these rock formations. I can feel their spirits. It motivates me and mobilizes me to continue fighting for our rights, indigenous rights. Voting with love means remembering my people, my, my forefathers, what they fought for, you know, to keep our land beautiful and sacred. We need to listen to our indigenous peoples as they talk about climate change and the ways to honor Mother Earth. Because without Mother Earth, there is no humanity. I vote to protect the sacred. <laughs> well, I'd be damned if, you know, if that's not inspiring. Um, every Sunday, every day, every week, every interview with all of you, I am continually re-inspired to continue down this path with all of you. Um, thank you for being here. Um, always and um, find your inspiration and take it far and wide. Anybody want to add anything, subtract anything? Molly, um, who's not here, texted and said, I told her we were going to share her and Cap's 
journey to Nevada. Yeah. She's yeah. far. Yeah, thanks. That's so sweet. There were hundreds, thousands of us trying to make a difference across the country. And we did, she says. All right. Yeah, I just want to add, I mean, Stacey Abrams has been a source of inspiration and just Yesterday, when she was getting all this recognition, her statement was, this is about collective action and collective impact. So she like refused to like truly be acknowledged as the individual. And she actually like threw it right back to the collective impact and the movement. And I thought that was like incredible. Like, I mean, that just like deepened my inspiration of, of her leadership. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Tom. Yeah, there's a lot of, lot of, a lot of places to see it, right? It's Tracy. Tracy. Yeah. Um, listening to all of this, um, you know, people who've done such wonderful things, and those of us who feel that, you know, there's no way we can accomplish that huge amount. Um, but I'm reminded of a quote by Desmond Tutu that says, do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. And I think this is an example of that. Beautiful. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, along that line, Mother Teresa said, we can't all do great things, but we can all do little things with great love. You know, and, and, and you know, I shared some of the tales of Dan, um, not to be self-aggrandizing, but, you know, I mean, I was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I went to public schools. Neither one of my parents were college educated. You know, you know and, and we've got our Zen center here. You have no idea how this stuff ripples out. You, you never know. And if you follow this possibility of, of this practice of the space inside the MSO and outside the MSO, it, there's no telling where, where, it, where it leads. There's no telling where it leads and, and what you can do. You know, I mentioned Piper Gianola of Cisco Systems. Cisco Systems was one of my clients. I was the lead global creative on that account. We were able to create an account, a, a campaign called Welcome to the Human Network, which was about the global interconnectedness of every human being on the planet. You know, it's a Buddhist message. It's a Zen message. You know, and, and because of the role I had at that time, we were able to spend $150 million a year putting that message out into the world. Sold some Cisco gear too, but the message was welcome to the human network. Together we are stronger than we are apart. So you never know where this stuff leads. You never know where the conversation in the grocery store, what effect it has on people. But Tracy, I mean, Desmond Tutu's statement there, I mean, it just couldn't be truer. We do what we're doing every moment, knowing that it ripples outward in ways we can never imagine. Anybody else? Galen. Yeah, this is just gonna be a blatant sales pitch. Uh, it's so easy, you know, when things happen like this election to just go, wow, we made it. Wasn't this wonderful? You know, let's party today and tomorrow start sending money to Georgia for the Senate race. This thing is never over. It's never over. You don't win. You win battles, but you never win the war. Please help elect senators in Georgia. And, and now we'll reserve 15 seconds for the opposing view. <laughs> I, have, I have something. Yeah. Thank you so much for this day and this talk. 
and just the Sangha being able to gather in the celebration. Um, I think, I think another thing that to add to like what we're all sharing right now is the inspiration and the organization, you know, to, to really be willing to organize love to move forward, organize love as a force. And we get to do that with each other, with our, with our individual inspirations. And I, I'm really excited about this time right now. And I'm grateful for all of you and all of your hearts. And yeah, it's great to celebrate. <laughs> it sure is great not to feel so pressed down. Yes. It feels good to breathe. And I've already donated to, to Georgia and I'm going to get on the calls. <laughs> Thank you, Mel and, and Galen. Galen, I didn't mean to in any way slight what you were proposing there. And, you know, thank you. Organized love. Thanks, Mel. Mm -hmm. Shalaya, that's a good one for the Instagram feed. She's connected back. Yeah, I know. All right. Everybody good? All right. Um, again, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, and Lori, hang on. Sorry. Sometimes because Lori's sitting right here <laughs> and doesn't want to be on camera all the time. I'm just really grateful for all of you and um, happy that we can be together and open our hearts in this way. And listen to inspiration and think about what inspires us. And, and, um, and thanks, Dan, that was very powerful, very helpful. Love you all. <laughs>